Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Brian Adams. Brian is the president and founder of Excelsior Capital, where he spearheads the investor relations and capital markets arm of the firm. He has over 10 years experience in real estate private equity and has advanced knowledge and best practices for strategic real estate investing. Prior to forming Excelsior Capital, Brian co-founded Primer Properties, an institutional real estate equity sponsor. Hey, Brian, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm doing okay. Mate, where are you dialing in from? You, you, you uh, Given it's COVID, I see that you're working from, from home office these days. I am. Yeah, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. So Love it. Tennessee, Love yeah. it. Love it, mate. Well, look, before we dive into the nuts and bolts of what you do, um, I kick off the show with every guest and uh, rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. Sure. Yeah, so I'm from New York originally, from upstate New York, out in the country kind of close to Canada. And my dad is a grumpy old attorney that's still grinding. And um, when we got into high school, my brother and I, um, every summer we would work heavy road construction. Uh, he had a client that owned a, a business up there. And so that was my first real job um, and was a good life lesson in uh, how difficult manual labor is. And those guys uh, continue to play a part of my life in terms of always trying to improve my educational uh, base because uh, it's a very difficult way to make a living. It's funny you say that. I spent a summer, first year out of uni, uh, not for, sorry, first year in uni, I was doing civil engineering, and a prerequisite at, in, in Australia was that you had to do, you know, your summer jobs had to be internships. And I worked for a company called Road Tech in Australia, which was the, the government arm of building roads. And I remember being 18 years of age and on a job in this, the hot summer you had to wear long sleeve shirts because it's you know very skin cancer prone and just you know I remember pouring diesel on the concrete forms so the concrete wouldn't stick to the it was the first real like oh why do you put diesel on concrete forms so it doesn't stick or why do you put a little bit of a uh, uh, dishwashing liquid in the concrete so it it has more viscosity like all these little things you learn being a civil engineer you don't really learn it in the in the classroom you actually learn it grinding and i just the, the boys i work with it was some long slogs of days and yeah. to your point the the education piece is uh it, it really drives home just like do well at university so you don't yeah. have to ever have to you know i was working with guys 60 years of age and it's like that's they've been doing their entire life yeah so, brutal uh, work and <laughs> tough on the tough on the body these guys would just crush it all summer and then try to kind of put together odd jobs in the winter and yep. make enough money in the summer that they could live and hard, hard living people too. Yep. Um, so that was the first buck I ever made. That's awesome. That's awesome. So now walk me through the journey, right? The, the, yeah. the, the entrepreneurial journey through, through college and, and afterwards before breaking out on your own and, and starting Excelsior. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, my father's an attorney in upstate New York, grew up out in the country. I went to an all boys military school for middle school and high school. And then I went to uh, a small liberal arts college in Connecticut where I played the cross. Um, and I met my wife in college. So we were up in Connecticut together. She's from Nashville originally. We did the Northeast thing for a little bit. I went to law school in Boston and then moved to Nashville about 15 years ago. Uh, I practiced law for a couple of years. My wife's family has a single family office based here in Tennessee that has exposure and has invested with uh, sponsors and GPs in the private equity real estate space over the last 25, 30 years. And so I just had enormous um, luck and fortune to marry into a family that had these type of connections and resources. And that's how I got into the business, really through the LP side of things. Um, I connected with a business partner who's another New York guy that married a Nashville girl. 10 years ago, we started our company and We'll probably get into this. Uh, we started syndicating capital to individuals and families. We grew really fast. We raised quite a bit of, of money, which I know is relative in our business, but call it $60, $65 million of equity probably in three or four years. Really screwed up the business for a whole host of reasons that we can talk about later. Um, I had to reformat everything, take it down to the screws and build it back up. Um, had my teeth kicked in by most of my investors for about a year. Um, and have relaunched probably in the last two years, continue to syndicate, but not make the same mistakes that I made the first time around. 
It's it's interesting that you've had a bit of a, a launching pad with your wife because a lot of people get into this business, particularly syndication, through the real estate, real, uh, real, uh, real. Oh, I can't even speak today. Uh, retail investors, the fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar investors, but to come in sort of at a at a single family office level, um, it's pretty 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 awesome. So how was that in terms of? Did that allow you to learn from the gr- gr- uh, grass up or, or, or did you have that sort of, it was so good at the beginning that it, you didn't know what you didn't know and that tends why you, you ended up you know, having some stumbling blocks along the way? Yeah, l- let's just kind of be real here for a minute. I Not only am I a decent looking white guy with a great education, so I just have enormous amounts of privilege where I can almost get any meeting that I want. Marrying into my wife's family gave me a huge advantage over the marketplace. So you know, it had positives and negatives, frankly. Uh, my father-in-law is um, a level one trauma surgeon who took a company public in the 90s. He's had enormous success. It's very difficult to be his son-in-law in Nashville because I'm always going to be Dr. Morris's son-in-law um, as opposed to my own person to a lot of people. That being said, I could get any meeting I wanted for the most part. I could pitch almost anybody that I wanted. And so that just gave me an unfair advantage. I would say that coming from the family office background um, definitely gave me a different perspective on capital raising and how I want to structure the company and informed the business model from day one. It took some time to kind of work through that, but definitely a different approach from say, a leasing broker or capital markets guy who got into the business. I really came about it from the LP side as opposed to the GP side. So I think it does give me a little bit of different perspective on things. 100%. And then you've got the other element, which is this massive syndication, you know, through friends and family and, you know, very small checks. I remember raising my first $100,000 from five different people with twenty with $20,000. And that it was just a very raw experience trying to pitch to someone who maybe doesn't have a ton of money, right? So I think- there's that there's that element of where you come from money and, and, and you know parting ways with fifty or hundred thousand dollars is a lot easier than coming trying to pitch someone who maybe not know a lot about real estate but they want to get involved and they're trusting you with uh, with a lot not a large sum but a, 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 a quite a large portion of their wealth and there, there's two sort of sides of that LPs that you coin you can raise from and uh, did you ever have any experience on that the sort of lower end retail side with with the the not as well to do um, LP and, and, and investors. Sure. So the hardest thing my father only ever did, but I think ultimately probably the best thing he ever did was he wrote a check for $100,000 when I wanted to start the company. No questions asked. And he said, listen, you can tell everybody you talk to that I'm an investor with you personally, not just the family corpus, like him as a person, which is different. And I'm going to make two introductions for you. Other than that, you're on your own. And I was kind of hoping for more frankly, more money and more introductions and just more help. But it forced me to go through and grind out coffee meetings, lunches, getting in the car, getting on a plane, asking for that warm introduction, begging for that referral, closing that first investor, talk about $5,000, $10,000 checks, doing it the hard way, having, you know, learning about sales, doing, I tried to do 10 calls a day um, and five meetings a day, um, every day when I first got into the business. And so I built up this network of people and I got all no's, right? I mean, just everyone, no, 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 no. And I would meet with anybody about anything. And all I kept doing was taking these meetings to try to be helpful to these people, making introductions for them, trying to build up that karma. And it was very difficult, but I think ultimately made me a better salesperson and understand marketing for sure. But I've also built up this just huge network and and resources of karma that continues to play out to this day where people think, okay, well, I had coffee with this guy five years ago. He made four introductions for me. I'm going to keep him in mind. And I still get warm intros out of those people, the property and casualty insurance brokers, the life insurance sales guys. There's a lot that you can learn from those people. Um, so definitely have perspective on, on the retail investor. And I, frankly, still mostly work with individuals. So we don't have any institutional LPs and I don't want any. Um, and that's where I spend most of my time still. I think they're terrific investors. 
but you've just got to understand the right way to approach them. And there's 12.4 million accredited investor households in America, not individuals, households. So it's really just a matter of, okay, well, you need to go out there and get the no's. You need to get some yeses, but this is a huge population. And you just have to have the right mindset, I think. Well, you bring up two really good points that I think people you know, don't want to skip over here, and that's referrals, right? Referrals, referrals, referrals. More than likely, and I've been in this in the exact same boat where you, you start with your mobile phone, the people in your mobile phone, your friends, your family, your cousins, your best mate from school that probably doesn't have a lot of money. You know, let's be honest, when you're first starting out and, uh, and, and it's through educating people about what you do, right? There's that first step. And I think what I'm hearing from you is that you were known as, a, a son-in-law to to a very well-to-do guy, and you had to get rid of that stigma, right? Like myself, I was a civil engineer and trying to get make a way in real estate. It's like, well, aren't you a civil engineer? And that sort of telling people seven, eight, ten times before someone says, "Oh, okay, I know what you do," and "Oh, okay, I actually don't have any money, but I know some people who do." And that referral is just is such the critical thing, and and the sheer mass at which you have to go out and apply yourself. I still remember raising that first hundred thousand dollars. I, pro- I had 50 people in my email database and I was like, oh, I'm going to easy raise half a million here. And just the, the the stark reality and the cold shower of like out of those 50 people, only four people invested. You Crickets. know, like, yeah. Cr- and, and, and there's nothing better than having, you can you can pitch, you have great pitch deck and, you know, good marketing stuff and they'll come to me when you've got a real deal. And, and the reality is when you have a real deal, everything scatters like cockroaches, right? <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, it's this real interesting type of like having to just keep going, keep grinding and then grow that database. So let's now pivot a little bit into the lessons. Like what what happened coming from that that sort of single family office, that $100,000 that your father-in-law gave you, then you could use his name. What what did you learn? What 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 went wrong in that first iteration? Yeah. So uh I've been doing a lot of these interviews and, and it's been terrific. I've had a lot of aspiring sponsors reach out and they kind of ask the same question, like, well, how'd you do it? The right answer is don't make these mistakes. But I think to give some people some actionable advice, if you want to start in this business, you need to write down a hundred people that will take your meeting. We all have a hundred people that will take a meeting. If you've been, if you're, you know, in your twenties and you're professional, there's a hundred people in your network. Take 10 people that will never give you money, like that jerk uncle that doesn't like real estate or your attorney that is super risk resistant and is just never going to invest. Take those 10 people, take them to lunch and pitch them and ask them for really, really tough feedback and criticism. Do that 10 times, get the pitch a little bit tighter then take the next 10 people who probably aren't going to give you money and try it on them. But do not go after your best prospects out of the game. And I think that's a huge mistake that people make. They say, oh, I've got my cousin. He's a tech entrepreneur. He had a liquidity event. I'm going to go ask him. Don't do that because you're not ready. And this guy probably knows a lot about private deals. He's going to crush you. Wait until you've got your pitch down a little bit better. And hopefully you've got a business partner and you can kind of Batman and Robin it and tandem up. I think it's a better way to pitch. Keep those guys in the cooler until you're ready and go after them, you know, after you've done this a couple hundred times. So I think that's kind of step one. For me personally, the biggest kind of mental shift in how I was able to scale the business was, and I see this a lot, you've got this shiny wonderful object that you think is just terrific. You've got this deal and this idea and you're very excited about it. If you can't raise money in this business, that idea is art. And art's great. It's not a business. Instead of going out there and just cramming down the idea or the product that you have, talk to your logical investor base. Like those 100 people, there's 200 people that will take the pitch. And spend some time asking what they want. Hey, have you invested in real estate? You have. Cool. Have you done private deals? You have. Great. What do you like about them? What do you hate about them? What's the experience been like? You'll start to hear the same narratives over and over again. You'll see the same trends. Figure out what they want. 
figure out what they don't want, understand the experience that they expect being an investor, and just fashion the product to meet those pain points. Because I think the big mistake I see with people pitching is they do the resume. I'm really smart. I went to Harvard. I went to Wharton. And I've got this cool idea. Nobody cares how smart you are. Talk to me about solving my problems. Talk to me and listen to me about what my problems are. And if you come at me right out of the gate with ways to solve the, the pain points I have in my problems, the pitch will go a lot smoother. I talk a little bit about, um, I've come up with this, this acronym called the 6P rule and, and these different P's of raising capital. And, and I've fashioned this formula. And one of the P's is pitching, right? And, and, and talking about you know, a, an effective pitch, right? And an effective pitch, think of you know, Martin Luther King, right? He didn't get on the Washington Monument by pitching it once. <laughs> it was thousands and thousands of pitches. So what advice when you're trying to go into a meeting because you've got the social pitch, right, where you meet someone at a social setting and then they like what you do. But how do you make sure that you're getting the emotive response that they want to engage with you rather than being that sort of, I don't want to say douche, but that I went to Harvard, I went to Wharton, I went to blah, 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 and bombarding them with too much crap that doesn't, you know, to your point, it's not solving their problem. It's just you're boosting your own ego at the same time. Yeah, and, and that's the key, right? It's sublimating your ego. The pitch is not about you. It's not even about your product. You need to come at pitching and sales from an empathetic standpoint. So putting yourselves literally in the shoes of the person across the table that you're selling to and understanding what they want. And, and I think once you shift that mentally and being just as empathetic as you can, understanding as much about that person before the meeting and now with social media and um, you know, the internet, you can get a pretty good sense of who that person is and what their life has been like, and probably extrapolate from that what the pain points are for them. If you go into that meeting with an empathetic mindset and you just give, give everything away. Like you don't have a secret sauce. Just give it all away. I think, I mean, you're still going to get a lot of no's, but I promise you the first 10 minutes of the meeting, if you just go through the resume, People, it's just blah, 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 blah. It's, it's the teacher from Peanuts. Like, no, they're just tuning out because they've heard it before. So if, if you go in there with an inquisitive mindset and an empathetic mindset, you'll have a much better conversation. And I, I don't want to be rude in this way that I'm going to use the analogy, but, you know, when you're, when, you know, you're, you're trying to attract a partner or, or a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever that might be, you know, I, I was always taught as a young kid, don't talk about yourself. Talk, ask, ask questions and, and, and being, as you said, inquisitive. Because being inquisitive means that it's not your agenda or it's not at least perceived to be your agenda when you're sitting down to pitch someone. It's, it, you're genuinely asking, coming from a place of, you know, vulnerability and, and being genuine in, the, in your ask of different questions. How's your family? How's COVID impacting? How's, you know, how's your daughter going, you know, graduating from university or whatever it might be? That brings that emotional side into it that they can start letting down their guard and you can, they can be vulnerable with you. And that's where you can get into the real nuts and bolts of what their problem is in asking that question, what is the problem I can help solve through an investment solution of real estate or stocks or whatever it might be? Yeah. Um, would, you, would you agree with that? A hundred percent. And I think, you know, that's exactly the right approach to go to the meeting with is, you know, if you're spending the most of the meeting talking yourself, it's a bad pitch. A great pitch is when you don't talk that much and the other person is asking questions and telling their own story to so just start out getting some easy yeses. Are you a human being? Yes. Like, are you interested in making more money? Yes. I mean, those are bad examples, but get some easy yeses, get the conversation flow in the right way, um, and skip the resume. I just, uh, you know, I think we can do better than that, frankly. And yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to just you know, jump in there. I come from a country where so many people put uh, emphasis on what high school you went to. Oh, what private school did you go to? Oh, you know, you all went to so-and-so boys college. You're like, who, who fucking cares? You know, like here in the States, it's a little bit more on the college side. Oh, I went to Wharton. I went to the USC. I went to UCLA or whatever it might be. And, and, and I, I 
tend to agree when you're talking to an everyday person, you know, an average person, they sort of, who cares at the end of the day? They can look that up themselves. Um, I want to pivot a little bit now into some of the other mistakes that you made and that you learned in the beginning. You know, obviously there's the pitching and, and coming from vulnerability, but what else ultimately was your undoing? And maybe that was it, but is, was there anything else that you could you could look back and say, yeah, okay, ego and pitching was a real problem, but there was also this other thing that, that also had to solve for. Yeah. I mean, I made a thousand mistakes and I continue to make mistakes, but there's a couple of big ones. For me, the epiphany was I actually started listening to what my logical investor base wanted. I started giving them what they wanted, which was capital preservation, income generation yield, and a lot of tax benefits. I mean, it's pretty simplistic, but honestly, that's what they want. And I can give you my pitch in two sentences. Once I figured out that part of it, the capital raising went relatively smoothly. And the syndication business and that model is a terrific model. And I think a really underserved marketplace still for accredited investors. And the mistake we made was we became deal guys. We just, because we could raise on deals, we, we did them. <laughs> the closing deals, acquiring more property and constantly on the hunt. And we didn't realize, and this is something I talk to aspiring entrepreneurs about a lot. When you, we were talking about addressing issues in the pitch on the front four, there are the real estate deals and they've got to work. But then there's this whole other part of the process that is you're taking a risk as a small business owner. Because all of these things like investor relations, reporting, communication, HR, even asset management to sub-level, tax, accounting, they have nothing to do with the deals themselves in terms of the underlying real estate aspect of it. So you've got two risks. You've got the real estate risk, and then you've got the small business startup risk. And I completely underappreciated the amount of time, money, and resources that would go into having a small business. And so I either third-partied it, or I didn't spend enough attention or, or, or time on it. And it ended up crushing me. And when you don't give investors 100% transparency and terrific reporting, they're going to assume the worst, even if the deals are working. Because how are they supposed to know? They're not living it day to day. And so I got my teeth kicked in for about a year and I had to go to 254 investors and explain to them why my reporting was garbage, why my investor relations was pathetic, reassure them that the deals were still working. I mean, it was terrible. And it's something that you can easily avoid if you just make sure that you're doing the right thing from an infrastructure perspective on your small business. With that being said, what, what types of things weren't you doing that you're now doing today in terms of communication to the investors to keep them feeling like there's a pulse there and, and, and up to date with everything that's going on? Yeah, I just crush them with information uh, and just absolute massive transparency. Uh, so we do some, I mean, these are things that I think a lot of people are aware of, but uh, you know, I was oblivious to. We have Juniper Square as our investor portal, right? So 24-7, 365, people can go on, check the account. They can look at historical distributions. They can upload the K-1 in a secure fashion. And it's terrific. We send out monthly P&L statements on the asset level every month. We send out quarterly distributions via ACH as opposed to live check two weeks after the end of quarter, every quarter. We send out really, 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 really good quarterly updates on both the asset and the market level. And we spend a ton of time on it. So it's things like that, it will actually save you a lot more time because you just won't get the phone calls. As long as you're doing a good job of communicating and investor relations from that perspective, it will ultimately save you a lot of time and money, I think, frankly, to not have to go back do the conference calls, go to that person's office, explain everything that's happening. Because people can, for the most part, high net worth individuals and families, they can accept when deals don't go right. I mean, it's a, it's a big boy game. There's a reason you need to be a accredited investor. You're taking risks there. But there's no reason that everything else involved in the small business side can't be institutional level at this point, considering the amount of tech products that are out there that are frankly pretty affordable. What, what 
personnel did you bring in house in order to help you? Have, and and what, what I'm hearing is not necessarily, well, it's, it's small business, but it's customer service, right? That's what it is. And it's making sure you're having the best outward facing customer service when someone comes into your sphere that from soup to nut, from signing up to, or so from getting to know you to understanding the deal to signing up through, you know, investing in actual deal, looking at your reporting process. You're right. It, you, a lot of it can be quote unquote outsourced, but who did you have to bring in house to make sure that you weren't missing any of those steps along the way and people felt like they were being treated with, with, with cotton wool and, 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 you know, with rubber, uh, with gold soft gloves. Yeah. And this is where, if you listen to a lot of, um, SaaS B2B podcast, or, or if you follow some of these folks on LinkedIn, they talk about it as the customer's journey. And I, and I think that's the right analogy for this is paint me a picture of what it looks like to be your investor from when I have coffee with you until five years into the deal. And if you can't, as a sponsor operator, tell me exactly what that journey looks like every step of the way, you're making a mistake because you should be able to. And one of the biggest issues I had was I didn't have an internal controller. And so the first thing I did was I hired a CPA with a public accounting tax background who actually could speak to people like a human being. And this made all the difference in the world. I brought a marketing person in-house. So we create tons of content. I try to be considered a thought leader. I crush my investors and my network with educational... um, thought pieces, best practices, things that have nothing to do with real estate directly, right? Because I want, when they have a problem in their financial life, I want to be the first phone call. Brian, I want to sell my business. I don't trust these investment bankers. Who you got? I need a new PNC person. I have a 1031 problem, et cetera, et cetera. I want them to call me because it's not just about the deals and the real estate. It's about that relationship. And I think that going back to our kind of empathy conversation, that is the key to success because what we talked about earlier is exactly right. Getting a current investor to re-up with you and open up their Rolodex of, of contacts, so much easier than going out and bringing in a new relationship. It just takes time. 100%. It should, it should take time. So the more that you can focus on your current LP base and just smother them with love, content, everything they want and understand exactly the issues they're having, the better your business will be and the better it will grow. I, I talk a lot about on this show and actually interviewed the, the author of a book called Key Person of Influence, Dan Priestley. And he talks a lot about being that thought leader and, and, and in real estate specifically, you know, people invest in you first and foremost, Reed Goosens or Brian Adams, you know, whoever it might be because they trust and respect you. The deal's actually second. It doesn't, you know, that it, it makes, you know, it's a cherry on top. It's the, the, the icing on the cake, whatever you want to, analogy you want to talk about it. But, but having that trust and transparency where you're coming th- from a point of education and teaching people about what you do and, the, and back to the steps in which this is what you're going to expect. These are the types of reports you're going to, you know, get from us. And, and that's what I learned when I, when I tried to raise that first $100,000, what I had the cold shower of, and probably similar to yourself, Brian, was that I wasn't doing a good enough job on the education side. People didn't had not heard from me enough to say, I trust him. I trust him to do right with my money because I haven't been forthcoming. And that was really the, the, the inward facing self-reflection that I needed to say, okay, I need to go be, be better at marketing, double down on the podcast, double down, whatever it might be. But similar to yourself, you also had that, that, that epiphany of like, okay, I need to be you know, a thought leader, a key person of influence in my sphere, right? Because people are going to trust you. And through that trust comes more referrals. And that's having that warm lead who then introduces you to, to more investors is so much easier to cultivate than trying to go out and do it cold. So I 100% be, be, uh, agree with you on that. What are your thoughts on that key person of influence sort of status and, and, and being that thought leader and how important has it been to your business? Yeah, I think it's huge. And COVID has really struck home to me all of the tools and network available to me to essentially be a 24-7 access point for these folks, right? I mean, through LinkedIn, through podcasts, through webinars, through blog pieces, I'm, I'm constantly there for them. Even though I might be you know, playing with my kid or sleeping for parts of the day, 
we have all these terrific tools around us where we can be accessed 24 seven. And, and I think your author is exactly right. The points he was making about trust. D- digital assets is what it is, yeah. right? You're, 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 you're je- uh, je- uh, magnifying your story, your, your pitch, your processes, all that stuff to, using podcasting, webinars, blogs, you know, video. So very, I, I 100% agree. I want to, you, you said something earlier, which was kind of interesting. The, the, the love for the small LPs versus the institutional. You obviously come from institutional background with the family office, with raising money from public markets. Do you want to talk to me a little bit about that and why, and why is it that, and I hear that a lot, and we, we, I built my business on the same thing, $50,000 checks at a time, and we're actually now only going down the path of the first time over a private equity firm and because we, 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 we've never done it before. We think, oh, this is going to be easier than trying to herd 250 cats <laughs> into a boat and get it going. Give me your perspective. Yeah, and and I don't want to rain on your parade. And I have strong feelings about this. Um, I think a lot of sponsors and syndicators and and general partners think that private equity is the solution to their problems, the golden key that when they reach it, they can unlock the castle doors and everything's good. And it's the right fit for certain people. And, and what I'm going to say is based on my own personal experiences, you've got to understand that doing these private equity deals, these 95, five deals, these 90, 10 deals, whatever it is, it is in no way the private equity group's interest to ever see you be successful outside of your relationship with them, because then you are competition. And these people are smart. They have tons of capital behind them and they work very hard. Why on earth would they let a talented sponsor or GP ever have the ability to go out and raise their own fund of discretionary capital and talk to their LPs? They wouldn't. That's why over 85% of all the institutional LP capital raised over the last cycle has gone to five firms. So the entire structure is set up to never allow you to actually gain enough capital personally to go out and raise your own fund. Because a 5% commit or a 10% commit for a $250 million blind pool capital fund, that's big boy stuff. It takes a lot of cash. So the structure legally and economically is to have you do all the heavy lifting and the work with the care of your carried interest on the back end. But if you wanna stay in that private equity game, you need to continuously roll in your carried interests to stay in that game, it's the carousel. It's very difficult to get out of once you get into it. And and it's interesting, and, and maybe we need to define private equity for, for you know. For me, it's someone who can write, who probably syndicates their own money right for, per deal, but they have a a different rolodex of investors. Then you've got the you know the insurance companies and the really big PE. So how do you differentiate the, between the two? Because if for my, my if I go to someone who's got who can write a $10 million check, I'm like, that's a private equity firm because I don't have to go raise $10 million. Maybe in your mind, that's slightly different. Maybe you can give your perspective on that to the listeners. Yeah. And that's where I think I get the question a lot of, how do I pitch family offices? You know, how do I do this? I think about it from a perspective of, are the LPs and the investors behind that relationship, are they taxable entities? If they're not taxable entities, they're legit institutional. If they're taxable entities, they just have a lot more zeros behind their names. And and I think fundamentally, I want to work with individuals and families because they appreciate what I do and they appreciate that they're making an allocation to me for a specific niche perspective. I've just had negative experiences on the other side where people want to come in and run my business. And that's what, when somebody wants to co-GP with you, they're getting in bed with you. And that's running your business. I want investors that want to support my business and want to be partners with me, but will let me run the business the way that I think it should be run. Because these co-GP type setups and these non-taxable investors, they don't, the interests are not always aligned in my opinion. Interesting. And, and we can have a whole different conversation about this, but... Um, 
that's been my experience. So, so just to for those people who might have missed that, you, the the taxable entities versus the non taxable entities, and it goes back to the need and the solving of the problem in the beginning when you pitch, is because one of the reasons you invest in real estate is a hard asset. It has so many tax benefits, right? And that is so. That's it's, I, I like that. I think that's that's good. That's good. That's it. So even if you have someone who can write a ten or twenty million dollar check and they've got taxable entities behind them, they're not they're maybe necessarily quote unquote private equity, but you might you know they, they might be just a big family office or have a group of family offices they can go pull from. Yeah, a hundred percent. So if you're and I'm very transparent about this, LPs that work with me should be concerned about returns on a net of fees after tax basis. Because once you start looking at things on a gross basis, it's just a different mindset. And the Blackstones of the world, et cetera, the reason they focus on gross IRR is because there are no tax implications for their LPs. Mm. And the minute they buy something, they hate it because they want to get their carried interest. Interesting. For me, my LPs, if the deal's working and they're getting quarterly coupons, and I think the deal is underlying the asset is, is still going to be a good play for the next five or 10 years. I'll hold on to it and keep getting the cash flow. But these other groups, it's all about that carried interest. It's all about that gross IRR. And you know, you're giving away major decision making rights to them. So you might think it's your deal, but it is no longer. Right. No, 100% agree with all of that. Um, as we come to wrapping up the show here, a couple of last questions for you is, one is what, what major piece of advice you had to aspiring syndicators, capital raisers, you know, what, what's that one piece of advice you can give to them listening to the show today? And the second question will be, where's the future of, of what you're doing, um, you know, with, with, with Excelsior um, and beyond? Yeah. So one piece of actual advice uh, I would give folks is understand and embrace the fact that you are the chief sales officer. Like when I get pitched a deal and not even real estate, but by an entrepreneur and say, okay, well, if you raise $10 million, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to hire a sales team. Eh, wrong. You are the sales team. Because in this business, it's so capital intensive that if there's not somebody in leadership who is 100% focused on building those new relationships and maintaining the ones that you have, you will fail. It's just not the business for you. And that's okay. You can go do different things, but that's just, this is what we do. And so I think just having that, as you, I like that term cold shower. If you, if you have that on the, on the start, I think you'll be able to manage your emotions and expectations a lot better. In terms of the future of the firm, I've been saying for years, and we're starting to see it play out, that the democratization of access to alternatives is real. And giving accredited investors access to what for a long time was the purview of only a very small percent of the world to these interesting deals, I think is fundamentally key to your own financial literacy moving forward. Because even if you don't believe in it, now your 401k has private equity in it. They just diluted the accredited investor status. Like private equity is coming for all of us. Even if you don't want to participate in my deals, you at least need to spend some time educating yourself about what private equity is. Because the stock market is getting more volatile. There's fewer publicly traded companies. Companies taking longer to go public. It, it, they're staying private indefinitely. And so I think for us at Excelsior, we're embracing that. And we're trying to just be there as a resource for people as they try to understand a little bit more about what this whole big, complex, oftentimes opaque world of private equity is. Love it. Love it, mate. Well, look, I want to thank you for jumping on the show. At the end of every show, we'd like to dive into the top five investing tips. Ready to get into it? Let's do it. Mate, what's the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Sleep. I get as much sleep as I possibly can. I was pre-COVID. I was one of those guys grinding at four o'clock, getting up, gym, travel. But now I've just become obsessed with getting much more sleep and my energy and my efficiency and my productivity have gone through the roof. Yeah. A lot of people sacrifice sleep thinking they're going to be more uh, efficient, more productive. But with, produ with, with more productivity comes 
uh, attacks on the body that you just can't ever buy back, right? And creativity, and, yeah. <laughs> and creativity, correct. You, your mind's so filled with stuff that you can't have time to think about, well, what's the next step and where's this ship going to? Love it. Uh, qu no, question number two is, what is the most influential tool in your business today? When I say tool, it could be a physical tool like a journal or a phone, or it could be a piece of software that you use on a daily basis that you can't run your business without. Yeah, I'd say Juniper Square. It's just been a game changer for us. Um, and then LinkedIn, honestly. Uh, and but part of it was because it was I was forced to because of COVID. I can't, could leave my house for a while. Um, but it's an incredible platform. I mean, I mean, that's how you and I connected initially. And it's 650 million people. Microsoft says they want to get to 2.4 billion in the next few years. It's just a great platform for other professionals to network and get free advice. That's what I tell entrepreneurs, I tell investors, like you've got this unbelievable network at your fingertips. And if you just reach out, people probably just give away most of what they think is their secret sauce for free. I will. DM me. I'll tell you anything you want. Because I think it just builds karma and it always comes back. And so it's that virtuous cycle. Love it. Love it, mate. Uh, question number three is who's been the most influential person in your career to date? Yeah, my father-in-law for sure. Um, being a leveling trauma surgeon, running the Life Flight program at Vanderbilt, uh, taking a company public and having three daughters who are all just crushing it. Um, a real, he can be, it's intimidating, but it's also very inspirational about what you can do. And so um, he's taught me everything I know pretty much about private and public markets. Love it. Love it, mate. Uh, question number four, in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure in your career today? I know we've talked about a lot of failures, but what's been the biggest failure that you, and what did you learn from that failure? Not scaling the business appropriately through investor relations and communication infrastructure. Love it. Yeah, I think it, I think that's coming quite forward to the front, but it's uh, it's going back to what we were saying before about the the key person of influence and understanding you are the sale, like you are the salesperson, and they will invest in you first and foremost. Love it, mate. Last question is: Where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Yeah, you can go to the website excelsiorgp.com, or I'm very active on LinkedIn, Brian C. Adams, Excelsior. Uh, connect with me, drop me a message. I'll set up a time to talk to you, and I'll try to be as helpful as I can. I think the most helpful thing I can do is try to tell you the mistakes that I made so that you don't step in the same pothole twice. Love it, mate. Love it. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. And I think the, the first and foremost is the vulnerability piece and, and leaving the, the ego at the door when you're trying to pitch someone is so important to re engaging in them in a way that they don't care about the resume. I think that the resume, throw it out the window. I love what you said about that because it's People get pitched that all the time and they just get sick of it. So uh, that's probably the number one piece of uh, advice I've taken away from today's show. Did I leave anything out? No, I think this has been a fun conversation. So thank you for having me. Awesome, mate. Well, look, I want to thank you again for jumping on the show. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Reed. Well, there you have another cracking episode, Jam Pack, with some incredible advice from Brian. Please do reach out to him on LinkedIn. He is a wealth of knowledge and is really forthcoming in giving his secrets away. And I think that's really admirable of him after all the trials and tribulations he's been through and the sort of scars on his knees that he, but he's been able to get back up on the horse and keep going. Uh, I want to thank you all again for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. The easiest way to give back to this show is giving it a five-star review on a platform wherever you podcast. And we're going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. Bye.